Nearly three in the morning now, Scooter had spent the last hour researching the book written by Joseph Rawlins in 1828. The book was a 1922 Thelema Publishing Company reprint of the original text, with an elaborate preface written by Alistair Crowley in 1910, over 70 years after Rawlins' mysterious disappearance and the mass suicide of his cult followers. One, Preamble to the Writ of Rollins, or The Esotericus Writ of Stars. A curious man in possession of heterodox perspectives of world and reality alike was that of the eccentric Joseph Gain Rollins, whom lived a reclusive existence the majority of his life, including his time at the Muskegon University during that particular institution's infancy. It would not be until the strange circumstances surrounding his death in November 1833 and the accompanying mass suicide of a dozen men and women, including his 15-year-old daughter Sarah, that would leave the name Joseph Rollins ingrained in the memories of generations to come. Even upon today, some may know an elder who is whispered to have known of Rollins' secret meetings inside the Black Forest on the darkest nights. But Elder Whispers lack in the profoundest of capabilities for discerning Rollins' endgame efforts. For what this singular individual accomplished places him, if only marginally so, on the shoulders of giants. Or, Nanos Gigantum Humorous Incidentes. And yet the torch now falls upon our treads to carry forward into new dark ages allowing us to look beyond the horrific accusations illuminating his death, one perchance can find the keys to unlocking a vast and immense elemental portal, glimpsing into the far reaches of metaphysical cognition and cosmological forces that extend beyond the average man's grasp. Yet seem to bounce with grace within Joseph's palms. Here lies our troubled world upon these frightful and senseless shores of time, and yet here we lie in as much disarray as the scholars of the Dark Ages. Turning now to face the sparring tomes of occult notations scattered from Boston to Atlanta to New Orleans to California. Blessing and worship to the prophet of the lovely star. Two. worthy. Bless and worship the lovely star. And with haste I had gone to brand myself wife and child with the blessed mark, the sign of the crawling watcher, gate maker. For he, though not the only great entity, it has been decided is the appropriate life essence to cast our worship upon. The branding of the mark did sting the flesh at the back of my neck quite severely, but tears from me the master would not do. Unfortunately, my wife and daughter wailed most of the night long. It is a blessing we have secured this home deep in the woods, alienating ourselves from the uninitiated world. Gustafsson Ratikaisen's disjointed would-be Magnus, the ill-begotten circumstances of modern astral children, has become exceedingly unfavorable to the persons inhabiting the inner circles of my ilk, and thus the task which to remedy the unfavorable text has befallen me as it has been deemed. I had visited Gustafsson and Espoo several years ago, and can still recall the quaint evening we spent on the edge of Lake Bodom. Gustafsson spoke in plain tones about the possibilities concerning the manipulations of time and space, and temporal planes existing simultaneously on the relative axis between multiple linear and parallel reality channels. My fellow associates must understand that at the time of this meeting I was nothing more than a pupil of the theories of relativity being touted deep under the veils of lighted society where only the select were permitted into chambers of the occult sciences. It was without question that the peculiar man, Zach Grouse, who made accessible the members of the inner circle, 
would in short time become the fellows of Ministry of Ignonid. It was also peculiar Mr. Grouse who brought forth even more peculiar documents that to my knowledge appeared to be written on thin sheaths of animal skin. When inquired as to where he had procured these strange documents, Mr. Grouse informed me that the origins were not of my concern. Further study of the strange documents revealed that the writing on the pages were explicit instructions on performing ritualistic tasks. The Ministry theorized that during some moment in human history, perhaps the 1400s, birth of the Tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, had managed to place restricting binds made of fear and conformity to browbeat the masses. Everyone would stop looking for the truths that natural forces could offer, because mankind had finally given birth to the most powerful social and political institution, the Roman Catholic Church. The truths of the universe cannot remain hidden forever. There are greater forces beyond the scope and reach of saints that will grant the answers of all life's questions. One only has to know how to listen to the lovely stars. Mr. Grouse. As in, Zack Grouse? Scooter continued to thumb through the pages of the book, pausing to look over sepia-toned photographs showing Joseph Rollins, his young and beautiful daughter Sarah, and his wife, and other men who'd belonged to the cult, and other photos of the Rollins house circa 1830s and beyond. Mr. Grouse would, at some point, while we dined in the house, explained that because of our ambitious efforts to alter space-time and reality, a godless endeavor, he said, that he had been compelled to step forward with his documents and further assistance. It was obvious then that it struck me to know Mr. Grouse was a vastly educated and worldly man who was more gripped by empirical truths than hollow faith. This was, of course, quite comforting to know, for the Ministry shared mutual beliefs. We had not set out to prove something that we already knew did not exist, but to find the tangible proof of what did exist, out there beyond cosmic sparks, and how those energies could be reaped by man. The most astounding tome that Mr. Grouse presented onto me was the Sermon de Cornu Serpentium, Sermon of the Crawling Horn. The dusty old book claimed to be authored by Yaster Ferreira the Older, an Egyptian priest from the Nome, or district, of Memphis, who served the Pharaoh Menes. Scribed in the papyrus pages of this remarkable tome were the mad ravings of Yaster, whom claimed to have spoken to a horned man while deep inside the chambers of an unfinished tomb. The horned man had appeared to him so clearly and with strange distinctions, as though he'd come solely to this plane of mortals with the absolute purpose of speaking with Yaster most direct. Upon commandments given by the horned man, Yaster was to record the horned man's sermon that he would give on the nightly in the same subterranean chamber beneath the earth and stars alike. Mr. Grouse claimed that this ancient tome would aid my discovery of a deeper universe, saying too that this text would be a stepping ladder to reach the shoulders of giants, and then I would topple those giants like the ruined stone petals of the now forgotten and nameless city near Giza. Mr. Grouse assured me that the footsteps I was to leave within my occult-bound journey would not falter, and they would not go unseen or displaced by time. My work for him would not go unrewarded. Like Yaster the Old sitting in torchlight within the incomplete tomb, so did I sit on my hearth night after night with the passionate tutelage of Mr. Grouse at my side. A prophet he was, I was certain. The man had traveled the world and knew more about the most remote corners of this world than I knew of my own backyard. Mr. Grouse was the wisest of the wisest men I'd ever come to know. And on one strikingly impressive summer night that will forever haunt my mind, Mr. Grouse foretold to me that someday, in the distant decades beyond my own existence upon this particular plane, there would come another who would be in dire need of my scholarly apprenticeship. Mr. Grouse alluded that this unnamed person would be for me to tutor as he tutored me, and that this person would become his dark priest as Yaster was to menace. 
Strangely, I gathered the audacity to ask then what would become of me. He surely answered me without a breath's pause. You are to remain high upon my council and serve as one of my finest prince generals. A cool wind fluttered over Scooter. He looked up and panned the dark room, but saw nothing. Switching on his flashlight, he scanned the room again. The white beam rolled over book spines and skittering shadows. Suddenly he was lifted from the chair and tossed onto the long table. Something unseen shredded his clothes. He was rolled over. Flat on his back, Scooter stared down his body, between his naked thighs, his briefs dangling from one ankle. Zack's visage appeared at the end of the table. Dressed in blue jeans and a black tee, Zack appeared as an average teenage boy. In significant embarrassment, Scooter cupped his groin. What are you? Must we get distracted by labels? Let's practice more heterodoxy and less conformity. You're the devil, aren't you? I go by many names. Using his left hand, he began counting. Beelzebub, Antichrist, Satan, the Accuser, the Deceiver. He began counting on his right hand. Lucifer, author of all sin, king of the bottomless pit, appointed cherub, chief of demons. A sixth finger sprouted. Mephistopheles. Six more fingers grew. Destroyer, devourer, fallen angel, father of all lies, adversary, and my favorite, a real classic, Prince of Darkness. Right, got it. So you really are real. Zack's clothes melted from his body, leaving him nude, penis erect, and acrid strands of smoke curling up from the gaping hole on the tip. He slithered over Scooter's naked flesh. Scooter held his breath as the devil, personified as a naked 17-year-old boy, situated himself over Scooter, his torso resting on Scooter's. Zack's burning rod of a cock burned against Scooter's soft and flaccid penis. Zack's face hovered over Scooter's. Satan's breath came out oddly sweet but bitter, like dark chocolate laced with ground celery root. I'm not gay! A forked tongue scraped roughly across one of Scooter's tiny nipples. I can work with you, buddy. Zack's image shook and blurred. Naked, beautiful, and smiling, Amy's face now appeared. Perky and petite breasts dangled over his chest while her pouty lips brushed over his. Their sexes ground against one another. Her soft, wet folds seeped warm juices over his crotch. Copious amounts of juices, and the smell was so intoxicating that Scooter's mind started to spin. There's a war brewing. You will fight for me. Amy's erect nipples scrubbed against his chest. Scooter shook his head. This isn't real. The head on his shoulders believed she was not real but the head between his legs didn't care. As Amy's intimate juices flowed from her, soaking his groin, his cock twitched and grew erect against his will. Detecting his expected state of arousal, the Amy doppelganger sat up, a sultry grin splitting her face. Reaching down and between his legs, she grabbed his cock in her tender feminine hand, giving it one loin screeching squeeze before shoving it inside of her twat. Tight, moist vaginal walls wrapped him with gentle firmness, and the muscles immediately began to milk his prick. Scooter hiccuped a laugh or cry. He wasn't sure which. Amy sat on him, unmoving now, her palms on his chest. Do I feel real? A tear rolled down his cheek. He nodded, lifting his hips pushing himself into her pussy, desperately wanting to feel her insides forever and ever. Reality is a state of mind, my sweet scooter. With both hands, he gripped her hips, bracing her while thrusting again and again. You will fight for me. 
a warm yellow light appeared at the end of the table. Scooter peered around Amy. Dressed in a fire engine red sundress, the image of a young girl appeared. He had no memory of his dead sister, but he knew the ghost child appearing to him now was Vicky. Instinctively, he knew she was trying to warn him. Warn him of the devil. Steer him to clarity. Hissing, Amy's chin lifted 180 degrees, stretching her neck to an obscene, unnatural lizard stretch state. Be gone, cunt child! Vicky's visage flickered before vanishing. Amy's neck shrunk back to its normal state. Her gaze pinned Scooter. Nobody can keep me from you. She gyrated, rotating her pelvis more savagely. Scooter's cock burned white hot with anticipation to come inside of her. Lifting his hands from her hips, she forced his palms over her small breasts. It's you and me, forever, every day. We fuck and kill and fuck some more. Fuck, fuck, kill, kill, baby. Tears rushed down Scooter's face. It wasn't real. All an illusion. A trick of the devil. He knew this. Amy wasn't real. And he wasn't going to fall for this again. He wasn't going to open his eyes wide to find himself balls deep in Zack's mouth. Or worse. Not this time. She wasn't real. Amy wasn't his. His dick went limp and slipped away from her dripping and doppelgangered cunt. Suddenly Amy's body sailed upward and away. She slammed into the bookshelf. Scooter jerked to a sitting position. Amy! From between two rows of shelves, a shadow appeared. The figure moved closer. And closer. Scooter watched. Silently. Petrified. Paralyzed. The person neared. The shadow lifted from his face. Shane.